you'll remember that at the end of Canto 5, Dante had fallen as if dead on the floor of the second round in hell. And at the beginning of Canto 6, he awakens in the third round. Suddenly, he's suddenly there. And I think that this signifies something about how new aspects of reality are beginning to awaken to him. It's almost as if um, they're already there, but his imagination now is just beginning to be able to grasp that they're there. So he doesn't, as it were, travel into the third round of hell. Um, the third round of hell um, appears to him as his imaginative capacity to sort of perceive it and receive it begins to develop. And that's one of the themes in Canto VI, that Dante shows the first signs of his awareness of the depth of reality, that, the dis that this descent into hell is beginning to work on him and show up to him. Um, he's beginning to become uh, capable of discerning it. Um, commentators often note how this canto too has a very different tone and feel from the previous one. Um, the, the canto on, on love and lust um, had a kind of high poetic kind of quality. Suddenly um, we go into a much more visceral, guttural, um, short, sharp kind of uh, poetry. Um, you know, there are lists of adjectives without much attempt to string together in beautiful ways. And this is showing us we're in a, a different kind of state of being as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's underlined early on in the canto uh, where Dante says just quite straightforwardly, I am in the third round. Um, he doesn't even uh, sort of go into, we then, as it were, moved into the third round. He's saying very directly, and there's something about that directness, that immediacy, um, which shapes um, the whole feel of this third round. Um, immediately they notice that um, this is a place of sort of relentless rain. Um, it's like being in a, a daytime storm where um, the atmosphere goes grey, um, the light fades, you can't tell what's near and far away, um, it's relentless, um, it's hard to tell the time, the sun's disappeared, um, it's that very kind of wet, greasy, thick deluge um, that uh, obliterates um, in a way all boundaries, um, you know, you're not quite sure where you begin and the world ends, um, everything is flowing awash in this water, um, and that again is a very powerful theme of this third round. Um, it's a kind of state of being uh, where everything becomes a kind of mush, a foul, um, undifferentiated whole. Um, and um, it's also an anhedonic place, as, as we'd say in psychotherapy. There's no pleasure here, no capacity even to know how to receive pleasure. Um, it's grey and there's no sunrise, sun setting. The weather doesn't give shape to the day. Um, you're not sure where you are even. Um, and pleasure... Um, sort of dissolves um, into the wetness around you. It reminded me actually very much of Chris Rare's famous song, The Road to Hell, uh, where he talks about um, where the river doesn't flow, how it boils with poison, um, how there's no light, um, how fear and violence um, seems to emerge from every pore of the place. Um, this is the road to hell. And while in the third round, um, in hell, it feels like Dante and Virgil are now directly experiencing this. It's called um, often um, the, the round of the gluttonous, um, but I think that this word is slightly misleading now because um, it doesn't, I don't think, mean just kind of gorging and eating a lot. Um, it certainly doesn't mean um, obesity. Um, I think what it means is something a bit more subtle and Pushing towards this a more profound sense of the round is important because I think that's what's beginning to happen for Dante. He's beginning to be able to see things um, with more clarity, more understanding, and so push more deeply into the state of things. And I think what this round's really about um, is a kind of um, uh, lustful um, weddedness to the material world, to materiality. Um, it's like um, the assumption is that life will only be satisfied with more and more material things. Um, now that's why um, this round feels so formless or soulless, we might say, because um, in the medieval understanding, which I think is still a good understanding actually, um, that pure matter gains its shape, gains its beauty, gains its relationship 
and gains its place in the world and then so becomes a proper ecology, matter gains that when it's infused with soul. Um, when is it where well, we can tell the difference between things? We can tell that um, a tree has a certain vitality and a rock has another vitality, uh, where um, the weather um, itself has a kind of quality and a character. Um, you know, the sun feels very different from the night. The rain has its own um, sets of, uh, of qualities, um, which, which brings it alive, in fact. Um, you know, the refreshing rain. Um, whereas in this third round, all those qualities of the material world have um, turned to mush, have turned to foulness. Um, and so um, its life is literally draining out of it. And that, I think, is the kind of key insight into a life which is purely wedded to the material. Um, that actually um, it drains the life out of it um, because it's a bit like walking, I don't know, through um, the terminal of an airport uh, where it's all sort of bright lights and um, everything is dressed in gold and red. Um, you can't really tell the difference between a packet of cigarettes um, and a bottle of perfume and then a box of chocolates um, and some kind of highly branded garment. It all sort of just blares at you with the same intensity. Um, that's very much what this round feels like. I mean, in fact, some um, artists, some modern artists have depicted um, this round sort of where brand names just show up everywhere you stare, um, you know, so much so that um, you just kind of feel sated and bloated um, with all these material so-called goods. And they lose all their good um, in that um, overabundance. Um, so I think that's the, it's that sort of sense of gluttony and um, being sated um, this much more material sense of it um, that, that, that this round is starting to tease out, starting um, to, to push towards our attention as it arises up in Dante's attention. Um, they meet, um, first of all, um, the fantastic beast Cerberus, um, who's the three-headed dog-like creature um, in classical mythology guards the entrance to the underworld. Uh, Dante does his own thing with Cerberus um, he's got kind of human qualities as well as dog-like qualities um, but what you take from him overall um, is that again this is a kind of living creature um, that doesn't really know what it's for um, it's just sort of as it were pure undifferentiated instinct um, and um, uh, it so becomes monstrous, um, out of control and monstrous. Uh, Dante talks about how its um, its muscles are twitching, um, its head's just writhing, um, it's tearing at things without really knowing why. And in fact, when Virgil approaches, Virgil knows just to throw it some of the mud, some of the muck off the ground, and Cerberus just grabs it and consumes it unthinkingly, um, and it, it satisfies him for a moment. Um, and uh, but of course only for a moment um, but nonetheless it's, it's strangely a monster that's quite easily controlled because it's so unthinking just throw mud at it and it'll sort of be happy um, it's like a dog um, without the intelligence that dogs have um, it's like a dog that's been traumatized um, you know if you have pets um, and dogs you'll know that actually they're incredibly smart creatures um, they they're very aware of their environment um, they're very responsive um, and they're very, they have souls, they have presences which are shaped by habits, shaped by um, loyalties, shaped by affection, shaped by tasks. Um, Cerberus is like an anti-dog um, where all that has gone, that soulfulness, that intelligence, that reason, you might say. Um, we were talking about reason as the kind of harmony and resonance with the divine presence in the cosmos. This third round is where that reason has been stripped away and all you're left with is some of kind of sheer living flesh in this dog Cerberus, um, which is strangely a mixture of terrifying, um, but also easily placated in fact, because it's sort of dumb flesh, um, soulless flesh. What's also really interesting is that when they start to notice the souls in this third round, um, they notice they're all lying down. And in fact, even more striking is that Dante, um, who has a, a living body, um, is able to step on these souls. Now that's actually quite a rare feature in hell. Um, normally um, the souls um, don't have bodies because the bodies have been left on earth. Um, the souls have left their bodies behind. Um, and commentators wonder why in this third round Dante is able to, to step on the bodies. What is it that gives these bodies substance? Um, and my sense is it's because their bodies, their souls that haven't quite left their physical bodies behind. Remember, we're in this kind of psycho-imaginal zone. 
um, where what is psychologically experienced shows up tangibly before you. And I think that these bodies um, that they have in the third round are actually the kind of echo of their physical body, that because they haven't been able to leave physical life behind, materiality behind, they've kind of carried into the, in, with them into this um, round of hell. And so Dante is actually even able to tread on them, um, such as their weddedness to the physical world. And um, again, it's a bit like the stories you hear sometimes of hauntings, where um, the haunting is caused by a soul who doesn't really know they've died, who doesn't want to leave this material world behind them, um, and so hangs around. Well, in a way, the souls in the third round of hell have left the physical world, but they've kind of dragged it with them too. Um, I think this also explains why they're lying down, um, as well as being able to be trod upon. And they're lying down because um, they lack what, in the material understanding, was known as levity. Now, levity um, is that which rises up to the heavens. It's the spirited nature of things. It's the soulful life in things. Um, and it counters what was known then as gravity, which was that which causes things to sink, to lie down. It's like their material pole as opposed to um, their spiritual pole, which is represented by levity. Um, and in a good um, creative creature um, or in a, um, a living organism or even in, in the world as a whole, um, it knows, as it were, about um, this balance between um, its spirited aspect, um, its levity um, and its material aspect, its gravity. And so it finds its place in the ecological whole um, and has its own intrinsic beauty that speaks to the beauty of the whole. Well, in the third round of hell, they've lost all levity. And so they just sink and fall flat, these souls. Um, they're, they're drawn purely by the weight and the gravity um, of existence, um, which uh, leaves them uh, sort of flat and unable to, um, to even really move. Um, they lack um, that inner vitality. Um, and so they're both lying down and Dante is able to tread on them um, because they've still got remnants of their material substance, which they've kind of dragged with them um, into the third round. It's very interesting to think about levity because it's a word now that tends to mean kind of lightness and laughter. And that's an echo of the much richer ontology of the medieval mind. You know, and when someone has a kind of spirited nature, you might say, and they're able to laugh, they're able to take pleasure, they're able to, to show humour. Um, and they have a kind of lightness in their body. Um, you know, they're definitely physically with you, um, but they sit on that physicality, sit with that physically physicality um, sort of rather lightly. Um, and so they bring life and um, when you're in their company, people that have levity. And that's still how we experience, I think, um, this, this old medieval sense of levity, which was supposed to infuse the material world with a kind of lightness, with a kind of laughter and a humour, and um, with pleasure and gaiety. Um, that's gone in the third round. And so the souls are flat on their faces and Dante is able to tread upon them. Now then one sits up. Um, and um, uh, asks Dante, who am I? Um, and um, Dante, again, sort of stressing um, the, uh, this formlessness um, that, of this third round, um, Dante can't recognise this soul. Um, and this soul says, but I shared the city of Florence with you. We lived at the same time. Um, and um, Dante looks at him and, as it were, even his, you might say that what gave him uh, his character in life has gone. And so even though um, his sort of fleshly appearance should be familiar, because that inner vitality is not pushing out, Dante can't recognise who it is. Um, and the soul has to tell him, the soul has to remind him. It's actually a chap called Kako. Um, I think there's a bit of a kind of alliteration in the name there. Um, Kako is someone that hasn't been identified um, as an actual living Florentine. Um, but nonetheless, um, he and Dante speak. Um, it's very interesting that the first thing that Kako says is, um, do you remember me? Um, this is a theme which is going to show up now in the Inferno, um, that the characters who are there, they're very keen on being remembered. Um, I think it's partly because there's a vague sense that if you're remembered, you're prayed for, and maybe it would assist you um, in these in hell. Um, I think it's also because it, what starts to show up for Dante now is that um, the souls are very preoccupied with the past. Um, they're 
they're constantly, as it were, going over in their minds what happens in their life. They're, they're caught, it's part of this repetition um, compulsion, which we noted earlier, um, that they're stuck um, with how things were on earth. And of course, how things were on earth is now shaping their experience in hell. And that's why they're in hell. They're, as it were, not able to experience anything new. Um, but as much as they're preoccupied with the past, um, they're also, um, it starts to become clear that they're very um, fixated on the future too. Um, and in fact, Kako here, when him and Dante start talking, um, Dante asks him about um, politics, more political concerns around Florence, rather than say the more personal concerns that preoccupied Dante when they met um, the lustful. Um, and I think this is because um, politics was how Dante experienced um, this excessive materiality, this excessive materialism. Because Florence um, had fallen um, into a, similarly a kind of undifferentiated state, um, uh, it, it had become disfigured itself, much like um, the souls in hell and um, in this third round of hell, and Kako himself had become disfigured. You know, it's a, it, it's a warring body politic, you might say. Um, it's a dishonest body politic. Um, it's it's constantly grabbing, um, it's not flourishing, um, uh, uh, and then particularly with this sort of civil war, which is so particularly um, disfiguring of, um, of civic life. Um, so that's how um, Dante inquires um, uh, to Kako about um, uh, the meaning of this state um, that they find themselves in. Um, and when, how Kako responds um, is by giving a prophecy of the future. Um, very interesting that um, they seem to have a kind of particularly keen sight for the future, these souls, um, but without um, being that clear about it at the same time. So Kako gives these kind of uh, vague intimations that, um, that two are going to fight and then three sons will rise, and it's given in this rather gnomic form um, that is left rather unexplained in the canto, and people have tried to explain it about the Gelfs and the Gabalines, the Ghibellines um, fighting, and, and the white Gelfs particularly, um, which was Dante's side, whether they're going to triumph or not, and they've made um, um, inferences to the Pope at the time who um, wavered and couldn't decide who to back, which deepened and intensified um, the warfare. Um, but in the canto itself, this is left um, unclear, which I think, is, again, is part and parcel um, of um, this state, that even though Kako can see something of the future, um, he can't really make sense of it still. Um, so this sense of, uh, of, of bad discernment uh, pervades um, the whole um, mood of the, of the canto. Um, certain qualities do come up though, and again, they're perverse qualities. So um, talk of pride, um, talk of envy, and talk of avarice comes up. Um, and I think, you know, pride is the desire to possess to hold on to, to say it's mine, um, rather than to um, experience it as the flow of life. Um, envy, you might say, is um, not just the desire to have what someone else has, but to destroy what this other person has if you don't have it. Um, so it has this sort of destructive, dissolving quality, envy. Um, avarice um, is the desire to accumulate more and more. Um, it's the mistaken idea that you can enrich life by accumulating more. Um, that too um, is shown, begins to get shown up um, in this canto. Um, they talk about this, um, and then Kako says, you know, that's it, that's me done for the, for, that's all I've got, I've got to say to you. Um, it's as if he becomes a bit sort of exhausted, or he just quite quickly reaches the end of his capacity to converse. Um, and this is a very interesting moment where it says that he gazed at Dante for a moment, and he squinted in his eyes. And then just kind of collapsed back um, to lying down, to falling to the ground of the third round. Um, and I think this is Kako having the briefest glimpse that actually he'd seen Dante, that something new had, and unexpected had happened in the present moment in this third round. And he was trying to get a fix on it, trying to focus on it, trying to see and understand it, but he couldn't. And so um, collapses back into his kind of overwhelming nature, um, which is his condemnation, um, and so falls back onto the ground. Um, Virgil then steps in and um, says that um, these souls will be lying now flat on their flat on their faces um, until the final judgment. Um, and he gives a bit of sort of hell 101 again, um, as Virgil often does. Um, he says that uh, um, the unfriendly judge will come and judge them 
um, and give them their bodies back. Um, and then Dante and him talk about that and, as it were, their pain will intensify. Now, I think that the fact that Virgil talks about the unfriendly judge here is a bit of a clue that Virgil's got something of the truth um, with the final judgment, um, but not the whole of the truth. And in fact, the whole of the truth may turn out to be very, very different indeed, because, of course, the final judge will be the loving judge. Um, and indeed, um, Virgil and Dante um, were told have one of their conversations, which they don't tell us all about at this point. And um, it's one of these secrets, um, which I think means that at this juncture in hell, this third round, um, neither Dante the pilgrim nor we the listener are quite um, able to understand, quite able to really see deeply enough into um, at this point. And we're being led on the descent as readers to this is part of our initiation so that our imagination can open up that little bit more um, so that we can see and understand more deeply, much as be has begun to happen to Dante um, in this round. And indeed, we do get the sense by the end of it that um, uh, he's not weeping, he's not swooning. Um, he does mention a few times he felt like weeping, but he doesn't actually do it. And I think that that's because Dante is beginning to get to grips with, with what this descent is really going to ask of him, um, sort of in his consciousness, in his awareness. Um, it's going to ask of him to begin to um, uh, uh, see things more clearly, um, not just, as it were, receive... Um, for the things he's always been told, but to know it for himself, um, to see there's more subtlety, more wisdom going on um, than perhaps he'd realised. Um, and he's getting a sense, you might say, of the value of the descent. Um, the canto ends rather interestingly um, with the appearance of another uh, mythical creature, um, the figure of Plutus. Um, but it ends there, canto six, um, and we pick up who Plutus might be um, in the next canto linking the two cantos together again for the first time um, in the inferno um, but suggesting perhaps that canto seven is going to deepen our wisdom our understanding of what's going on further <laughs>